Hi, I'm Kieran Ford. Hi, my name is Natasha Munez del Mora. And uh, we are PhD candidates in the Faculty of Education at the University of British Columbia, Vancouver. And we're here today with Dr. Sandra Dobkin, who is joining us from Perth, Australia. Good morning, Sandra. Hi, everyone. Thanks for inviting me. Dr. Dobkin completed her MA and PhD in Language Education at the University of Technology in Sydney, Australia. She's currently an Associate Professor, a Principal Research Fellow, and the Director of Research at the School of Education at Curtin University. She's the author of numerous publications and seven books, including most recently her book, Translingual Discrimination, published by Cambridge University Press in 2022. She's joining us here to introduce us to the phenomenon of linguistic racism, something she has researched extensively, and to answer some questions regarding linguistic racism in the K-12 context and its connection to colonialism. So let's get started. Natasha, you want to kick us off? Yeah, yeah, we're going to start with some questions regarding linguistic racism and the concept in itself and how we can translate it to, you know, to an audience of, uh, for teachers audience. So you want to uh, know a little bit how, uh, what is linguistic racism? And can you give you give us an overview of, for those who are unfamiliar with the term? Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, linguistic racism is uh, sort of rather like um, emerging sort of term or a concept. Um, so I wrote about linguistic racism in my 2020 um, special issue on linguistic racism, which was published in the International Journal of bilingual education and bilingualism. So in that special issue, I, I try to define the term, right? Um, so according to that um, definition, uh, basically linguistic racism ref uh, refers to these all ideologies and then ideologies, structures, and also the relevant practices uh, which are used to sort of legitimate or which are used to reproduce this unequal power unequal division uh, between uh, like between language users between groups only uh, defined basically on the basis of language so uh, linguistic racism is sort of like you know um, all these ideologies and practices uh, uh, in which uh, for example you know what kind of language uh, what kind of uh, particular language that person for example uses as a first language or as a second language, and then how you know these people use those language or linguistic repertoires or resources, or which language this person does use or does not, you know, does not use, and all of that. So all these norms and uh, you know all these rules or practices and ideology, ideologies that are sort of like related to a uh, person's linguistic repertoire. So when I say linguistic repertoire, uh, you know, how that person uh, sort of, you know, speak language or use language. So that is basically, um, you know, in short, what we mean by linguistic racism. Mm. And as a, an emerging term or, or a concept, what, what did people call this before? Like, I, I have the sense that people sort of felt this or certainly experienced this, right? Um, but but did people talk about it under another name or was it part of some other way of looking at things? Or uh, what did people refer to this concept as uh, in, in earlier times? Yeah. I mean, in my field, which is applied linguistics, um, uh, we had some, you know, previous research based on uh, language-based uh, discrimination. So it wasn't necessarily called linguistic racism. Uh, sometimes uh, I know some research, which was um, uh, some research, some group of research, and they call it just linguistic discrimination or language discrimination, right? And recently I know from the, um, especially from uh, uh, North America, we have a concept called uh, racial linguistic pr uh, perspective, which is, um, you know, sort of developed by Flores and uh, um, Jonathan Rossa. Um, but all these terms are uh, sort of like, although the main ethos are quite similar, you know, when you really look at the analysis and context, it's also, uh, you know, quite different as well. For example, the linguistic race racism I'm talking here is um, 
basically the data is based on multilingual or multicultural communities in Australia, uh, whereas uh, the North American perspective, racial linguistic perspective is basically based on very much the um, uh, sort of like a North American context, right? Uh, and, and so on and on. I, and the other group of studies, which is called linguistic discrimination, it does not necessarily look at the other intersectional, um, you know, traits because mm. linguistic racism is not only about sort of like language-based discrimination because we're going to look at other intersectional racisms as well as part of the linguistic racism. So yes, we did have a different sort of terms before, but overall, especially in applied linguistics, it's kind of sort of new, you know, uh, terms that are emerging, but it's emerging very actively um, in recent years. Sorry, and I wanted to add that um, uh, for example, I, I, I was uh, giving this public talk at the Western Australian Public Museum, and I had a lot of, um, you know, public members who attended my talk. And after my talk, they were coming to me and telling me, uh, you know, for me, it happened a lot, uh, like, especially at workplace. There was this woman from Colombia, mm. you know, and she has a very strong uh, Colombian accent when she speaks English, right? And then she said, uh, although she's a lawyer, uh, her accent is always mocked at workplace. And she sort of like really took it really sensitively. She she feels very inferior about her accents. And she told me like, I, I didn't know how to call this. Now I know it's called linguistic racism. Right. So and it's, it can, you know, the research can be translated into uh, practice in terms of uh, also general sort of people. So yeah, that that's that's like, I guess our main purpose today. That scholars have been talking about this in terms of linguistics and other things, uh, but I think you know people have experienced this so much, and when we've mentioned this to people, they go, "Oh yeah, that that thing that happens to mm. <laughs> so many people yes. and around us." Um, so Natasha, I think where are we going to go next with this? Yeah, it resonates to me because it's the same experience for me. So, like, I have this strong accent and and I have, like, a lot of, um, you know, for example, even for doing things like that, like, okay, yeah, I'm shy when I'm presenting. When I'm writing, it's a different, different, totally different experience. So that's why it resonates to me, uh, you know, like, to work with your work, too. And we are also interested in context, work context, and especially the school context. So can you provide examples broadly from your research on what linguistic racism looks like in a school's context? I mean, if you have these examples from a school's context, I mean, you talk about the lawyer and other uh, work contexts, but probably schools are really interesting for our audience. Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, my research in terms of linguistic racism, it was uh, based on this bigger, large research. Uh, well, I did at Curtin University with my research team as well. So we sort of worked with around 150, uh, you know, non-English speaking background migrants. And out of that 150 um, migrants, we also worked some students, um, you know, in primary and high school in an Australian context. Also, we also interviewed their parents as well, right? So we do have some data in terms of school. Um, mm -hmm. So when we talk about a school, um, linguistic racism usually happens in um, uh, to students who uh, whose English is sort of not their first language, right? So English as additional uh, language students or, or, you know, international students in an Australian context or migrant background students or, you know, in, in the household, they speak um, their first language, for example, their heritage language. And then when they go to school, they need to speak English. Right. Uh, but as I said, linguistic racism is also not only, you know, as part of the um, language based discrimination, also the race is heavily involved in that, you know? If you're a person uh, 
with migrant background, if if you're not, for example, Anglo-Saxon background person, uh, if you're, you know, the person of color, and then plus your English is not your first language, linguistic racism is obviously more, you know, um, uh, the reflection of the linguistic racism can be very heavy on these people. So that's why the racism comes in as handy as well, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, so based on our data, uh, I actually published a paper, in another paper in the International Journal of Bilingual Education and Bilingualism. And that paper had some examples from schools. So I can give you some examples that I have sort of, you know, um, uh, that I have uh, sort of presented in that paper. So in that paper, I can give you the example of the uh, Vietnamese background student who, um, you know, moved to Australia when she was um, uh, 12, 13. And then she, you know, joined Australian public school um, right after she emigrated to um, Australia from Vietnam. And obviously her English was not good, right? Um, she s sort of really struggled with her English at school. Um, when she started speaking or learning English, um, she had a very heavy Vietnamese accent. Um, she she couldn't really, you know, catch up with the study. She was not really familiar with sort of like, you know, the school curriculum and all of that. But for all of that, what she felt was uh, she felt really ashamed. She felt really ashamed of being a migrant background student or being a Vietnamese student only because of her English, because her English was so bad. As soon as she started opening her mouth, uh, she said, uh, you know, her classmates used to laugh, right? Like mm -hmm. laugh as a class. Everybody would laugh at her. So that's one example that she was, she was, she felt really hurtful. And I call that as part of the linguistic racism, ethnic accent bullying, because it's part of school bullying as well, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just following on from that, so ethnic accent bullying in schools. Um, I'm wondering... You've certainly identified mental health, the impact of of, of um, linguistic racism and mental health of students. So, I'm wondering, is there sort of a an unexplored role for teachers to 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 address or deal with this, or is this something that teachers are aware of and find trouble navigating, or is this something they need further attention brought to on? Where's where's the role of the teacher in addressing this? Yeah, no, it definitely needs more attention because. As I said, uh, the, this uh, phenomenon of linguistic racism is very sort of like new phenomenon in Australian context, I guess, because I worked in an Australian context, right? Mm -hmm. And I think especially, okay, we as academics, you know, we know this is happening and all of that. But when you try to translate our research into practice, it's not really, you know, there. So when I, for example, I, I did... I did give this talk for primary school teachers um, uh, in Australia recently. So I, I talked to some primary school teachers. I have introduced the term linguistic racism. They were not really aware of that. They were like, you know, uh, we are so busy. We have so many students. And for us, this linguistic racism, we haven't really thought about it. You know, there are some, some sort of bullying um, you know, examples, all of that. But, you know, we just didn't really think about it. So thank you for like, you know, highlighting this because we, we are more aware of what is happening now, right? So we really need to raise awareness, especially the educators, teachers, primary public school teachers. We've got a long way to go. Mm. It's a sort of um, maybe, a yeah, an under underexplored, kind of bullying it's that sort of insidious stuff that can happen in a classroom but obviously would happen in the schoolyard as well and when we think of yes. bullying we think of the sort of general psychological stuff it's generalized and physical bullying but the the focus specifically on ethnic accent bullying or the overarching concept of a link linguistic racism um yeah so something that perhaps you're saying people need to know some more about uh, um what i mean is it's, it's really sort of like also hidden sort of racism, right? Um, we talk about other types of racisms a lot, for example, racism based on one's skin color, racism based on, uh, for example, I guess, um, 
I don't know, all this uh, religion, right? But when we talk about linguistic racism, it's very hidden. Not so many people sort of like take it seriously or, or, or you know, they didn't really think about it. And then when they see the examples, they're like, yeah, right. This is what happened to my child, you know? Um, so that ethnic accent bullying is really sort of common, especially for non-English speaking background, migrant background students in an Australian uh, you know, public school context. But also on top of that, another trait of linguistic racism, we call it explicit type of linguistic racism, right? So what is explicit linguistic racism is basically, you can actually tell, identify straight away, this is linguistic racism. It's very, very clear that you know, you're being racist through your language. So what is that is, um, uh, for example, you know, people would explicitly say some, you know, racially motivated words or expressions, you know, uh, and then the other person will get really hurt by that. But when I was talking to one student who's, um, I think he was from India, a Indian background student, he was really hurt. And I, I would have, a, I have identified this as linguistic racism. So um, when he goes to school, you know, in Australian context, um, you know, they have lunch boxes and they 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 prepare their own lunch boxes and they bring their own lunch boxes and they sit in the yard during the break time and start eating their lunch, right? So he used to bring this Indian curry, right? Mm -hmm. Indian curry, his traditional food, for example. And then he was bullied as well. Mm -hmm. Like I will call it ling explicit type of linguistic racism because it's coming out from the perpetrator and then they say oh god you know you're a curry puff right you're a curry puff I can't stand the smell of the curry and he was hurt a lot and then I remember he told me it became physical because he was so hurt he hit the book the other perpetrator one day and it be in it, it escalated to a higher level it become a problem for that school you know and the parents were really concerned and hurt about that and then from that event that boy he never wanted to take his traditional food to the schoolyard he mm. he would tell his parents i want western food i want sandwich right you know? so there's that sort of He's internalization kind of, of that the inferiority complex and sort of rejection exactly. of your traditional culture and this could potentially lead to problems at home perhaps seeing their parents as the instigator of their trouble more so than the bully right yeah exactly so it just it just related to so many other problems the inferiority internalizing and all of that right so the parents they they don't they're not sure what to do and then they go meet the teachers and teachers are not really sure what to do as well right so um yeah these are these kind of examples are very very common but you know uh, we need more sort of like evidence to, to yeah to and even in terms of teachers themselves they they don't even know about this implicit racism they might be applying I mean, like working with teachers now, and it's like uh, they tend to assess them differently, for example, or like without even noticing. So I think the awareness is important. So do you have any advice for teachers, not only in terms of this explicit uh, mm. linguistic racism, but also in this implicit, you know, uh, linguistic yeah. racism that probably they don't even are aware of and that they need to i don't know address somehow i think in um, multicultural uh you know uh post-colonial contexts like um uh, especially like you know english dominant speaking uh multicultural contexts such as uh, canada usa australia uk teachers have to be very very aware about mm -hmm. linguistic racism because language is basically the expression and identity of that particular person right mm -hmm. and i think um teachers public school teachers for example they have been told uh, you know to teach culturally appropriate sort of or uh, appropriate curriculum you know we have to be aware of the multilingualism and multiculturalism and so forth but it is really not um, you know uh, it's very superficial, I guess. It's just a sort of like, you know, surface level, really. But mm -hmm. when it comes to really 
comes to these multicultural students in the classroom, our teachers need to be really aware, culturally aware, and also linguistically aware of all of these things happening, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, I mean, we as educators and we as teachers, we need to, we are the people who need to overcome linguistic racism. We need to identify linguistic racism if it's happening in the classroom. And we need to sort of, you know, prevent it, prevent, or we also need to intervene, right? Intervention mm -hmm. is also very important, I guess, to combat linguistic racism. So I guess the main starting point, I would say, would be, um, first of all, we really need to embrace the linguistic and cultural diversity in the classroom. For example, if one student is has a background, for example, I guess from India or China or Mongolia, you know, the students, uh, uh, the teachers should embrace them and tell them, you know, that, so, you know, your background is India. That's beautiful. Can you tell us about your country? You know, can you please introduce yourself in your own language? We would really like to know about your language. And, you know, that's a very, you know, um, uh, good push to combat linguistic racism, you know? Mm. Yes, Karen? Yeah. So um, asking people about their background in countries certainly helps sort of bring bring um, well, sort of give respect and acknowledge that we come from different contexts. Um, I'm curious about um, the, the the whole idea of standard English. If somebody is saying that you know this person doesn't speak standard English, and it it, it quite often what well, it I find that <laughs> quite an unhelpful thing. As far as I understand it, there really is no standard English outside of sort of written English. And um, so we could talk about academic English and the need for people, for example, in higher level or higher education to be able to write to a to a certain standard in a certain way to fit the academy. But is there a, mm -hmm. is there any standard spoken English and and where does the hierarchy of Englishes come in? Uh, we think of like mm -hmm. the UK variety, the American variety, but we have lots of speakers in South Africa and New Zealand and Australia and Ireland and like mm -hmm. English as an additional language speakers all over the world but their English mm. isn't good enough. So who decides mm. this and how do they do it? Yeah, yeah um, uh, part of the bigger picture of the linguistic racism, basically the ideologies around standard English, right? Ideologies around uh, native speakers of English. So um, in an Australian context, we have um, standard Australian English, right? So standard Australian English is sort of like English. Everybody needs to aspire. aspire. So, um, you know, when Aus the country Australia was first sort of, you know, like um, uh, when they were first, when the, the country first, you know, became the country as Australia, Australian English was actually considered as non-standard, you know. When Australians speak Australian English, it was considered low class, you know, bogan English and all of that. And, uh, you know, British English used to be sort of like standard English. Everybody needs to aspire British English. But nowadays, Australia has its own standard Australian English and everybody should speak Australian, uh, a standard Australian English. So I guess, um, you know, English is, is the de facto language in Australia. So if you speak standard Australian English, you are really good, you're powerful, you know, you can have an employment. Mm -hmm. If you can speak standard Australian English, you have access to healthcare, you have access to education, even renting, renting a house, you go and t talk to a real estate agent. And if you present yourself in a very beautiful standard Australian English, they are more likely to give you the house. Whereas, you know, if your English is very non-standard, you know, unconventional, if you, have, if you speak different English, there is a possibility that, you know, you will not be able to have access to education, housing, employment. So standard Australian English is a sort of like, you know, mm. the language we need to mm. all really aspire for. Well, I... And part of that ideology is, is, is quite uh, discerning because, you know, um, it puts people, it put people who speak different language as, as second citizens, really, you know. That that I, that idea, sorry, Natasha, just to follow up on the, the uh, standard Australian English. Um, of of course, it's nonsense to say that everyone, like uh, everyone in Australia, speaks that standard English. Like I'd imagine, very few people do. And in the same way, like there's a standard Irish English, but there are people in my country 
who you would need subtitles for to understand their English, as there are in Scotland mm -hmm. and in parts of England and in parts of the United States and, and these other countries that represent the standard. So they themselves don't mm -hmm. speak the standard. So it, it's more connected with whiteness and privilege mm -hmm. and less so with mm -hmm. actual sort of um, country of origin that we say. Mm, exactly, exactly. So it's part of the colonization, really, you know, the colonization, the bigger, bigger institutional colonization we are having, the whiteness, you know, the white Australia policy we, we had for a while. So uh, basically, if you're not Anglo-Saxon background um, English speaker, then you're different, right? You're different speakers. So whiteness is part of the intersectionality of the um, linguistic racism. Especially Anglo-Saxons is the bigger sort of like, you know, uh, more powerful privileged sort of language English users, right? So, yeah, it's um, it's all related to each other, yeah. Yeah, it's very similar here and this brought us to, to our next set of questions because it's really similar and my experience, personal experience is that, like that. And also I'm working with refugee people who are all talking about the same, how difficult for them is to get a job and to be respected, uh, even if they are professionals and they have a huge background in terms of their careers, they are, they don't, it's really difficult for them to find jobs and like that are appropriate for them. So um, the next set of questions are related to uh, this relationship with colonization and, and linguistic racism right like these two terms how we can see the relationship of these two concepts and because it, our audience is really interested here in how to decolonize a classroom right so uh, we would like to hear a little bit more about um, these two concepts and how you can articulate um, you know decolonization on there you, you already started with this but probably if you want to add something related uh, to to how we can uh, identify linguistic racism to decolonize our classrooms. So obviously, um, um, I guess colonization was basically built on racism, in my opinion, though, in my yeah. opinion, right? Um, so the part of the colonization is about, the main concepts of the colonization is about superiority and inferiority, right? So mm -hmm. the superiority of whiteness, white people, whiteness, English language, you know, mm -hmm. um, these are all sort of the colonization that happened mm -hmm. when when the settlers, settlers, for example, kind of came to uh, North America or Australia, right, and built their empire, right? Mm -hmm. um, so um, for me, in my opinion, the colonization was basically built on inequality, racism, and um, the legis legislations and practices were all based on, you know, white um, whiteness. And in Australian context, it was white Australia policy, right? Mm -hmm. So basically the colonization, what is saying is that one race is more civilized, more privileged, more powerful than the other race, right? So. The culture we bring here is more civilized. The language we bring here is more, you know, uh, powerful or more useful. And you, your race, your ethnicity, you know, you are second class, you know, citizens, people, your language is not relevant here. So that's all colonization, really. Um, mm -hmm. So so I'm, I'm very, you know, happy that the discourses of decolonization, decolonizing practices are emerging you know, in recent years, and it's good, and we it, it needs to continue. Uh, you know, so the decolor. I guess the linguistic ra racism is really, really directly related to the uh, colonizing practice, right? So uh, when we talk, as I said, colonization was built on racism. So linguistic racism was part of the colonization. What is linguistic racism? How is it related to colonization? Is very simple because you know one language is more powerful and more useful than the other language. So your language is not useful. Your language is not you know um, uh, not powerful than our language. So. Yes, yes, Karen, 
you're raising your hand. <laughs> I'm raising my hand here. I'm a good student still. Um, yeah. I'm just mindful of one of our, uh, our Irish uh, patriots had a, a saying in our language. He said, um, uh, Tír gan tángach, tír gan anam, meaning a, a country without a language is a country without a soul. And, and uh, just continuing what you're saying, like this idea of colonialism, a, a large part of the colonial mission was to uh, to eradicate the language of of the locals of the natives, and then there's this irony that once that's uh, once once the language has been destroyed as part of destroying mm -hmm. the culture, uh, they're then still considered second class citizens even though they're forced to adopt the language of the colonizer. So exactly. there's a sort of a lose lose there, which makes the injustice doubly hard to swallow. Mm. Yeah, I agree, Kieran. It's just um, you know the things. The way that happened is it's got so many layers and layers and complexity, right? It's not that simple just to explain, oh, this is what happened, this is that. But no, if you really look at it, there are lots of layers, lots of multi-layered, you know, complex ideologies and practices that was sort of built into racism and colonization. Yeah, I mean, uh, we have terms in my um, in my um, field called linguistic imperialism. Which were which were first, you know, really sort of introduced by Skatnap Kangas and Robert Philipson. So what they're saying about linguistic imperialism is, you know, English is dominating this world, right? So English is English and Westernization or whiteness is sort of colonizing um, the whole world. So we really need to be careful about this and because English is colonizing the world, it's trying to destroy other local languages. And you know, and they call it linguistic imperialism. And with the term, also cultural imperialism comes together. What is cultural imperialism? Is, for example, Americanization, you know, Hollywoodization, I guess, Coca Colaization, McDonaldization. This is all part of the Western cultural imperialism, mm. and you know, we need to be careful about that. So I guess that those terms are also as part of the um, bigger picture of the colonization. I guess, yeah. Yeah, and even in, when when you try to use a dominant language, you will never, never, never use it the same way. It's the same pattern with colonization, right? That even though you adopt all the Western behaviors, let's say, you mm. will never be white, right? And it's why what Fanon says, like a white mask and mm. black skin right like you will never be white right that is mm. something that happens in our context too right like we try to it, no not my case but but you know like in many contexts like latin america or i can imagine other spaces in which we try to westernize ourselves to be more educated more uh, integrated into society but we will never be there because we're not white right yeah. <laughs> So yes, though, exactly. Mm -hmm. Even though that's we, such we, an insider's, yeah, uh, Natasha, that's such a really complex insider's perspective, you know, because we all, already mm -hmm. we felt that we internalized that, you know, we've been through that. Even though your English is say like really proficient, really skilled, you know, you get all these high scores in IELTS and you write all these academic papers and all of that because you're not white your English will will always be stereotyped. So mm -hmm. in my paper, in my uh, latest book, Translingual Discrimination by Cambridge University, I talked a lot about this, why linguistic racism is also racism, because there's a term called, um, okay, linguistic stereotyping. So what is linguistic stereotyping is basically, um, you look at non-white people, non-white people speaking English, and that non-white people is the second generation of Australian. They were born here, they were schooled here, they were educated here, and they speak as, as perfect as the white Australians, they have standard Australian English. So there's another, another Indian student who told me that as soon as uh, you know the local people speak to him, they, they tell him, oh, your English is so good. You know, your English is so good, man. How did you learn English, uh, you know, so good? Or sometimes we talk about the accent hallucination, which is, um, which is, you know, as soon as they see the non-white people, they start sort of hallucinating foreign, foreign language 
language in their mind. And it's actually scientifically proven because in Ingrid Piller's study uh, at the university, they played, you know, um, a standard American English audio recording to the students. And then they should, showed two different people. One is white, white American and the other one is Asian Chinese, but the same recording. And then ask students, what did you hear in these two you know, lectures? And, the, and then uh, students said the Chinese looking uh, lecturer, you know, her, uh, her lecture was incomprehensible sometimes because you know, we didn't understand what she was really trying to say. Incomprehensible lecture. And, you know, this is the linguistic the stereotyping and hallucination. Whereas the American, white American students said, this is, you know, powerful lecture. We understood everything. So this mm -hmm. is really related to the skin as well, you know, when you when we're talking about language. So all these little terms such as accent hallucination linguistic stereotyping as soon as you see a non-white person you will assume or stereotype his english is not good mm. yeah. yeah yeah same like you know analogy that i can find with this idea of black skin yeah and white. absolutely yeah so any you know like if we address linguistic racism in classrooms mm. do you have I don't know any idea on how we can also contribute to the colonization, you know, like how to decolonize our language mm. <laughs> or how to make it more, uh, you know, like not expecting for a standard kind of or universal way of speaking, mm. but like how we can be more open to mm. different ways of expressions. And I don't know if you have last thoughts regarding that. Yeah, I think, um, you know, decolonizing practice will, will take a lot of effort. It will take a lot of time, energy and effort. But, you know, mm -hmm. it should continue. It should be the continuing discourse, especially mm -hmm. for our younger generation, for our students, you know. We need to make sure they understand what is decolonization, what is colonization, what is racism. They need to look at the past history, why people have been word colonized, why we are trying to decolonize now and so forth. And so mm -hmm. school will play an important part, uh, edu you know, teachers and educators, school principals, they will play important part, for example, to introduce school curriculum about decolonization, right? How to mm -hmm. decolonize, for example, language or race and all of that. But not only that, I, I think the school principals and teachers and educators, they also need to work with the parents, parents of the students as well, because students, you know, they get a lot of education from household discipline. If parents are not doing anything about sort of like, what is decolonization, why you have to respect and treat, you know, that student, uh, you know, differently, you know, um, or for example, if the student is um, Australian background, English speaker, white student, the parents need to educate them, you know, why your migrant background friend in the classroom needs to be respected and all of that, because kids, you know, they can't really sort of know everything straight away they're, they're children right they need to be educated so uh, that's really important parents really need to work with teachers and you know so that we can have that fundamental solid foundation about decolonization i mean decolonization in my opinion is basically writing back or basically speaking back against the ongoing colonialism and colonial mentalities colonial mentality is very important because you've got this mentality and you expect everything happen you know uh, based on your previous colonialism so you for example you are the native english of speaker so you expect to get that job because your english is you know standard australian english and that's the colonial mentality and we need to sort of dismantle that mentality right so in order to dismantle that it starts with the younger generation they need to be educated because i guess the elder generation um, it's a bit different from our younger generation so in my opinion as a researcher and as an educator i think we really need to work together uh, and also the teachers and educators and school principals they also sort of need to um, you know, they also sort of need to uh, 
give more real voices to migrant background teachers. For example, migrant background teachers, educators, they need to do the school principal job, for example, because they have such an insider's perspectives. You know, they need to be working at the po uh, policy making, decision making, you know, positions at the Department of Education. You know, we need a lot of migrants' voices also to decolonize these practices as well. Yeah. That's a great advice. But these yeah. are all starting points, you know. I can go on and on and on. Yeah. So yeah. Exactly. Like 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 what you said, like the way to decolonize is to give a voice to the actors, right? To mm -hmm. to the people who are experiencing this uh discriminations and this um, you know, bar barriers from society. So mm -hmm. if if we don't hear them, so, so how we can, you know start with uh, decolonizing whatever mm -hmm. context. And and it reminds me what I was working with um, um, Chinese young people that they are bringing their uh, Mandarin back just as a way to, uh, because it, it's the second generation Chinese. So it's like you say, like they, they speak English. Many of them are not speaking their language anymore. And then I, they were, uh, like aware of it and they are trying to bring this as a way of activism and it's something that is happening also I think in Los Angeles with Spanish speaker second language generation that they they lost the Spanish and then they are trying to bring it back as a way to be present in society so it's a kind of activism or activist way even though they speak the language perfectly they really want to yeah bring their language back absolutely so, that's one of the great activisms to de de not decompose sorry to decolonize mm -hmm. um you know colonization mm -hmm. Kieran. yeah I, I i'm wondering i'm just thinking about that middle ground there i'm certainly all for bringing languages back I, it's a great pity of mine that i don't speak uh, my own native irish as, as well as i would like um i'm wondering uh, as well though well, I've got, I've got, okay, I'll go with this question first. Uh, in, in terms of um, covert prestige as a sociolinguistic phenomenon, is there a sort of potential for um, encouraging people to speak uh, more of uh, a non-standard English and to encourage that and to sort of force, <laughs> to force legitimacy of that, uh, to sort of attack the standard by embracing the non-standard, I guess. I mean, people do this naturally at certain ages and certain demographics, uh, but it's not encouraged, I guess. So to make the covert prestige more overt, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I guess uh, also in one of my papers, uh, in the implication, uh, I did write about, you know, sort of empowering these people uh, you know, to speak how they speak, basically to accept how they yes. speak, right? If you if you accept these people and if you encourage these people to speak how they speak, obviously, first of all, the mental health well being will be, you know, improved. You know, the, the inferiority complexes will be gone, and then they feel more accepted. So the social integration, linguistic integration, will be more successful in terms of multicultural context. And, you know, just just sort of like encouraging someone to speak how they speak is a very empowering act, I guess, you know, um, they, um, um, you know, encourage and for example, in the classroom context, uh, you know, I always sort of write in my papers as an implication, you know, you need we need to sort of encourage our students to speak up. You know, mm -hmm. we really need to uh, encourage our students just to speak in the classroom. It doesn't matter whether it's non-standard English. It doesn't matter if it's standard Australian English. It doesn't even matter if they're going to use another language, for example, Chinese or, you know, Mongolian in the classroom, because it's only encouraging that communication and inclusion um, and all of these decolonizing practices we're talking about. Right. And, and then it would... <laughs> go ahead. Sorry, just on that. I'm excited about what you're saying. I, I'm all for that, too. I mean, people speaking how they speak. I, I see it as a wonderful opportunity for for cross-pollination, sort of from my, my language background, I mean, you're, we, we're, we're conscious that a lot of English words, we borrow words from German and French and certain cultures and less from other cultures, perhaps. Yeah. And um, like yeah. cultures around the world have wonderful words 
that we we Absolutely. could certainly adopt but they're excluded right because of the people yeah. who use those words so i think it's like yeah let's people speak how they speak and i'm like what does that mean oh that's cool i'm going to start using that too yeah yeah that's really sort of you know empowering you know it's empowering for both speakers you know so the another speaker is sort of like you know feeling empowered because their language is being sort of you know uh, being valued right whereas the other speaker is you know getting educated you know getting education from another totally different culture right and all of that is very empowering experience and it's very too easy to actually practice that in the classroom we can have a little tasks you know you know task-based activities and then just encourage our teachers how about you know today we can learn about this culture and you know you know what this culture says these words in that way and all of that and that's a very interesting sort of task-based activity to encourage inclusion in my opinion mm. and uh, you know and also we need to also remember that um, uh, english has not been english uh pre like present english like shakespearean english was completely different right shakespearean english Oh, look at the Romeo Juliet and all of that. Some of them we don't really understand, you know. It's a completely different English. And now the modern English is so different as well from the Shakespearean English. So as linguists, we, we say that language is always transforming. Language is always, you know, reforming based on that particular social linguistic history, politics, and all of that, you know. So language, we, we could never, ever sort of like, you know, stick to just one pure language, you know, linguistic purity is actually uh, mm -hmm. not, not going to happen because it's all about the diversity, the linguistic diversity, and it, which is all included in that particular language or culture. Mm -hmm. but, so, but, for example, you're talking about English. Now, English has a lot of words from Japan, you know, sushi, sake, or all of that. And it's almost part of the English words now. So, yeah. Who are the? I'm sorry, just thinking out loud. Like, who are the gatekeepers in terms of what words? Like, if we have a standard, um, like it's not like the French system, obviously, where there is like an academy. But in in English, like, who <laughs> is it? Just cultural trends, I guess. It's it's the media, particular parts of the media that are promoting whatever is mm. the flavor of the day or whatever. And I'm also thinking in terms of introducing words, like in in different in my country, for example, there were not so many restaurants shall we say serving food from all parts of the world and now we have that and i'm saying that like the sort of the same thing could be done with with english right it's uh, it's yeah. it's another part of the lived experience language and food have uh, so much of an impact on who we are and where we where we come from and, and our own culture yeah well obviously you mentioned that media plays important part in terms of spreading all these new types of expressions and new types of you know uh, linguistic mixtures and all of that but we need some kind of a gatekeeper who is going to standardize that and obviously media is not gonna officially standardize that right but I guess um, you know uh, you know there is this for example Oxford University Press Dictionary right new 2023 dictionary so they kind of standardize they decide that, okay, we're going to use this, uh, you know, sushi as part of the English language now. So we'll just put it into the dictionary. Now, if it's in the written dictionary, it's sort of standard English. You know? you, do, you, do you see the, the urban dictionary much? I refer to it fairly regularly and see that as I a... I do, I it's, do. It's a brilliant yeah. thing, right? Because that's the language yeah. people actually speak. By the time it gets to the dictionary, it's years old. Yes, I know. So... Uh, I do check that urban urban dictionary is all online, right? So yeah. if I if I come up with these new words that I don't understand that young people are using, or not only young people, uh, popular words in the media, I definitely use that. But then it takes ages for really to be to get standardized by the dictionary. Obviously, you know, it has, it, uh, linguists are involved, policymakers are involved, government officials are involved, and all of that. You know. Mm. Yeah. You could make the Urban Dictionary the official reference text and see what happens. Yeah. <laughs> now that is decolonizing, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Dr. Dovkin, we're conscious of your time here. We're going to be wrapping up. Natasha, do you have any final questions or thoughts or comments? My thoughts is like, no, that since she was talking about empowering and 
And since I discovered this term, discover your work and, you know, started to to connect it with my work and the people who I'm working with, I I feel more empowered. Actually, I mean, I, I it's like, yeah, why I'm not using it more, right? Like, for example, simple questions in the supermarket. I mean, you become shy because you don't want to express yourself because you don't want these reactions from people, right? So if you have a question in a public uh in a public site, then you can say whatever because you feel intimidated by that. But since I'm working on it, I, I I'm feeling totally empowered after that. Yeah. And yes. and I'm really glad that, that we found you and you are working so hard in this um activist academic work. It's really inspiring and thank you so much for yeah, no, thank you so much for inviting me. It was a pleasure talking to you. You two really raised this, some very interesting, you know, new sort of um, perspectives that I have never thought about it before as well, right? So thank you also for giving me more new sort of um, ways to think about, alter alternative ways to think about language and linguistic racism. And as you said, Natasha, when I first moved to Australia, I'm also a migrant background academic in Australia. I came to Australia as an international student. Uh, I have a Mongolian background, right? I studied as an international student. I totally felt so inferior, you know. I had this strong positive I image, strong, strong positive like imagination about Australia. I was so excited, right? So I thought, oh, people would be so accepting. I'm going to improve my English, you know. I will make a lot of friends. And I, I just was so excited. I was so young as well. Um, and then as soon as they came to Australia, it starts from the airport, you know, you start talking to the customer, customs officer, and they just blurt out something in English. And I can't understand, ah, oh, what did he say? You know, my kind of English is so different from Australian English. And then this is how I started feeling really inferior in, you know, and internalize all of that. And then I go to the grocery shop and then the grocery uh, sh shop assistant will tell me something. I don't know. Do you have a flyby's card? And I don't know what is flyby's card, you know, with a very heavy accent and all of that. And then you go to the classroom. It's a different story. Um, and then you accumulate all of this sort of small, I, I call it like micro traumas. You know, it's, it's not a big trauma. Like you start accumulating micro traumas related to your language in relation to your race and how people treat you. And then one day it becomes huge. Your mental health is in, in jeopardy, you know. So, mm -hmm. and then uh, this is actually my research on linguistic racism is also based on my own, own you know, personal experience as a migrant, you know. So it's also very personal. I know, I know this happened to me. And then as soon as, as I started working in this space, as you said, I started feeling very empowered because I could talk to people what I researched about, you know, I could communicate to people. I could even talk to policymakers, teachers, educators, and all of that. And it makes me feel really empowered. So I agree with you. And thanks for inviting me again. Thank you. Thank you for the work you're doing. And it will be really inspiring also for many teachers and people who who need uh, who need a word to express what they are feeling. You know, like that's what happened at least to me that, well, that's exactly what I, I'm feeling, right? Like, and I didn't have the words to to articulate it. And it's great that yes. you're Kieran, you have yes. something to add? No, that's all. Thank you very much, Dr. Dovshin. Uh, Dovkin, it's, uh, it's wonderful to speak with you. I hope we might uh, speak a little bit down the line. And as you said, our purpose is to maybe get uh, more conversations like this happening at our institution and uh, and across institutions mm -hmm. in Canada. So, yeah, hopefully our paths will cross again in the future. Thank you for your time. Thank, Thank you. So Thank you.